you. Thanks for having me. So, um, today I'm going to talk about online learning. I'm going to try to explain to you why it's um, good for you, why you need it, why. But before doing all that, I'm before showing you the library and why, I'm going to well, I'm going to tell you why. I'm going to tell you about batch learning, and I'm going to tell you some pain points that you probably all know about, but we always forget to. Um, I mean, we think we take it for granted. Batch learning. So batch learning is what you all know. Most of you, when you do batch, when you do machine learning, is your data. When you think of your data, you think of a big data frame. So you have like a big X, a big Y, and you learn everything at the same time. And then, depends on your applications, your use case, you're going to save the model, and um, yeah, and you're going to save the model, and then you're going to load it and uh, and use it. Okay. So in production. It depends. I mean, it's not like a clear-cut thing. Like we all know, we have Scikit-Learn or Keras, but when it comes to production, I don't think everything is as crystal clear as it should be. Um, so typically, you have your data somewhere. You're going to train a model, and then you're going to store it. And then, when necessary, maybe depends if you need to do things in live or not. You're going to load it and make p do predictions. So I don't know if everyone like agrees with this. Maybe not. Maybe you can tell me afterwards. But this is how I perceive it. But at least I'm I'm a PhD student, so I'm not sure. I've done some internships, but maybe that life is not like this. But I know this. Batch learning is hard. I have never seen people agree on this. I've never seen people say, "Oh, it's so easy to put machine learning in production." It is a hard thing to do. I think we need a lot of people with many degrees and. Masters, PhDs, to, and no one has like a really clean solution to this yet. I think, and my solution is not is not the the best, but um, it's like a different a shift at least. So some problems of uh, batch learning. So we all agree with this. You have to retrain your model. New data comes in every week. You have to retrain your model, and this is like a big thing you always do. When you um, when you do this, there's more data, and normally you need more and more and more computer power. Okay, big data. Models are static, so a model that you've trained this week, maybe next week, it doesn't work because new features, because, because, because for many reasons basically. But models, there's a drift. Models learn data from a certain point in time, and then it's they're static. They can't learn on their own what's happening. Um, so feature. This is a bit more subtle. The features that you develop um, locally might not be available in real time. What I mean by this is that you think that you found this great feature. Oh wait, what's? Let's check. Are yeah. Here as well? No, they're not. Because okay. <laughs> <laughs> you had a very good introduction. Yeah, I see people over there like. Okay, oh. yeah. so <laughs> I'll go quick. Okay, <laughs> this is. You must. Who is this weirdo talking? What's he talking about? Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, so batch learning. This is what you do. You're okay, you learn. You do. <laughs> production. Yeah, it makes more sense, right? <laughs> we'll get there. We'll get there. Hi, mum. Right. So funny. Batch learning is hard, right? So f this is what I think it feels like. It's like putting a square peg in a round hole, right? It just doesn't feel right. At least with scikit learn and many. Uh, so models have to be retrained. We agree. Um, more and more uh, computer power. Models are static and they rot faster than bananas because bananas rot fast. Um, depends. And features that you so we here. So features that you develop locally might not be available. So sometimes features that you think are good just don't work, right? Because it turns out that in real time they're just not available. And you don't know. So. Um, and just like Winnie the Pooh, we too um, used to bang in our heads, and we always just take things for granted. We don't think out of the box, and we just say, "Well, I'm not good enough." Or, but you don't really think about the, the approach you're taking. Maybe that the approach is wrong. Um, so online learning. So I'm going to tell you about online learning now. So online learning is simple. It's just the data is available one by one, and your model learns one instance at a time. So everything changes. And things like the number of features, dynamic. Could be three, could be ten. It's all dynamic. The number of classes, if you're doing classification, don't know it. At the, at the start, I don't know anything. Okay. I do know that I'm doing regression. I do know that I'm doing binary classification, multi-class. But there's a lot of things that I just don't assume. 
So different names, same thing, because I think naming is important. You can call it online learning, you can call it incremental learning, uh, you can call it sequential, out of course, it's the same thing. It's always learning one instance at a time. And the apl applications are many. Uh, maybe this slide should have been at the end, but just to realize, everything basically with data coming in, everything with live data. So you train your model, there's already new data. That's the kind of applications that we, we're hinting at. Okay? So not Kaggle, not uh, I have a train and I have a test. It's really, um, it's really different from that. And it's more realistic, more real life. Okay? So this is what it looks like in a nutshell. So, <laughs> so it's your data comes in, and online learning, I have to say one thing, is that this guide, the food, you don't know where it's going, but it, you, you, can, you can discard it, right? Okay, you don't have to st the store the data, which is really, really nice to have. So, but why do we all do batch learning? Well, I don't do philosophy, but I think for many reasons, and maybe the biggest reason is not at the start, it's the uh, library availability. Like, we have cycle learning, we say, oh, I have a hammer, everything's a nail. So, maybe it's because, you know, literature and the world before us, there was not this much data, maybe that we're just trying to, well, maybe that the maths and the code has adapted fast enough. So we're just all used to, you know, thinking of data as like one big block. But it isn't a block, it's a stream. And so for this, we created a library, me and some friends are here, um, called Cream. So Cream, because it comes from incremental learning. <laughs> Um, and the I API, you'll see, it's very uh, inspired from scikit-learn, so you have the same module names, etc. And so we started this in mid-January, I think. I started it, and then people, some people joined me. Um, and we just released version 0.010 um, this Wednesday. So I'm going to tell you about it. So just quickly, what we, how we see data, we see it as so one instance at a time. So features, a dictionary. And so the keys are the names of the features. And the values can be anything. So you maybe you know that in a dictionary, you don't have to, it's not statically typed. It doesn't just have to be numbers. It can be dates, it can be strings. So more fun to use than NumPy, maybe, because you can use names and you can have different types, etc. Sometimes that's a bit of a pain point you know, with scikit-learn. Anyway, I'm not dissing scikit-learn. I'm just trying to talk about something uh, different. But uh, so, yeah. Targets, uh, we, what you, we represent them as anything, it depends. It can be a string, it can be, but it's just a scalar value, just a single value. So no arrays, no, uh, it's always just one value. Yeah? And so streaming data, so this is the start of it. We, w what we do is, there's always going to be a for loop. There's always going to be a loop where the data is coming. It can be a Kafka stream, it can be a CSV file, it can be anything. But the data is only one observation in memory at a time. Okay? Um, and so here you have the API. The first method which you use is called fit1. So fit1, you give the model um, observations, yeah, but just one, and then a feature, and it learns. It adapts, it updates. So you see that things are completely different, right? This could live in an HTTP request, it could live in a for loop, it could live offline, online, and most importantly, if I stop training, and I can always start again later. Okay, so very, very flexible. There are some down, down. Uh, there are some problems to this, but not many. <laughs> <laughs> and so we have fit one. We have predict one also. So you give it one dictionary of features, and you get your prediction. Okay. So what's very important is that you can predict before training, and you can predict after training. Okay. So we say that training and testing are, are and prediction are interleaved. It's one after the other. Okay. So don't do the after, don't do the before, uh, sorry, the after. Don't train and then predict, because then it would be a bit uh, cheating. Um, but yeah, we have classifiers also, so predict probability one, predict probability one. Uh, transformers, transform one, obviously. Um, and so performance, for example, here I have my logistic regression, and I have a metric, accuracy. M well, accuracy is simple, to update it, you just say, is my prediction correct? Okay, so we have a metrics model, and in the metrics model, you have metrics that there's an update method. Okay, so I, what happens here is that I'm predicting. Uh, so the out of, so before seeing the date, before seeing the y, I predict for x. What am I saying? Is it, uh, is it like a class? Is it this value regression? And then I can update my metric, and then I can update my model, etc. And I can print my metric if I want. Or and so here you have composition. Um, so I'm just giving a few examples, but the, there's documentation afterwards, you'll see. Um, but yeah, so if you want to build a pipeline, so you want to scale your data, and you want to do a logistic regression, well, turns out you can do that online. Um, and so here you have the pipe operator 
Uh, this is kind of fun. Um, it's saying, I do a pipeline. Okay, so in scikit-learn, you say pipeline. You can do that in Cream too, but you can also do this with a fancy operator where you can just use the pipe operator. So, fun to work with. Yeah. Um, these are the models that are at the moment. There's 20 of them. And um, hopefully not more coming because it's too much code. But yeah, so you recognize a lot of things from scikit-learn maybe. Um, Maybe some fun things that we have that are not in scikit-learn that because we have the flexibility to work with it is recommendation. So we're also working on making online recommenders. So maybe some of you know of Surprise, the library to do recommendation. Well, it turns out that Surprise, the algorithm, the SVD algorithm, you can do it online. So again, we can do that too. Uh, we also have decision trees online. That's really fun and they're powerful. So I don't, I don't know if you know about them, but it, it, these things exist, right? Um, so I'm just going to show you some slight examples, not too much theory, nothing, but for example, say you want to compute a mean, the mean of some data, right? So what you would typically do as a human or with NumPy is you'd sum all the values and divide by the number of values, right? But that's assuming you have all the data at the same time. What well, it turns out is an exact al algorithm that works online, and you just use this simple formula and you can update your mean. So here you have it in Cream. We have like a stats module where you can have variance, etc., many things. And you have this update API. Update, get, update, get. So it's always the date comes in, I update, and then I get. Easy, right? <laughs> and there's a formula for variance too. So uh, this is called Welford's algorithm. Um, it exists for skew, it exists for kurtosis. So, and they're exact, right? They're, it's not an approximation, it's really exact. And it works. Um, and it's nice and it's not using any memory, and it's live, and you can do many things with it. So one thing you can do is standard scaling, right? Th this, uh, this was me, because this was the first algorithm that I coded in Cream, I was like, hang on, <laughs> what can I do now with online? Because if you can do this, you can do many things, right? So this is simple, you just compute the mean and the variance online, and then every observation that comes in, you scale it, okay? So you and after like 30 values, it's the same as if you use scikit-learn. It's exactly the same, it just becomes the same. Um, because with scikit-learn, you would have computed the mean on all the data, and, all d and the variance on all the data, and then you would have scaled. This is really one by one. So the, the, value, the, the values you're going to get at the end are different, but not so much. So it's worth it. And uh, we also have linear regression. We, we have many things, but linear regression, just quickly. Um, so we have this, we, we try to build like a really flexible API, but. Uh, maybe you know that there's different algorithms to find the weights of linear regression. Well, we made it so that you can use different optimizers, a bit like Keras. So in this case, I'm using Adam, but I can also use FTRL, what Google uses, or RMS Prop, or many things, or just plain, simple SGD. But um, yeah, this is just, I'm just trying to sell cream, but there's some fun things, right? You, you, you're not, you're bound, I mean, because we created this, we tried to make it really flexible and fun, and etc. Um, the same thing, this is a really cool one, so we wrote um, uh, a user guide, it's like a section in our user guide on this. But the intercept of the, our linear regression, we don't optimize it with the optimizer. We actually maintain a running statistic. So for example, we may, the, an, the intercept of our model is the mean, okay? But it's the running mean that I just showed you. So we can go a bit further with this, and I won't show you, but you can see online. There's, um, we can use the mean on the last x values. So say you can use the mean on the last 12 days, okay? So your mean is then adapting to drift, okay? It's changing. And for time series, this is really cool. Um, so yeah, with online models, you have some, some flexibility. So yeah, here we use rolling mean with 42 values. So it just it uses the mean on the last 42 values the model saw. Uh, same, you can do group buys online. So you want to group by a key and you want to can calculate a mean or uh, a sum or something. So in here we have some places and we have a revenue and we want to compute the mean. Well, we have this, mo um, this class in the, in the feature extraction module where you specify a play, what the key. So I'm going to group by on place and then I'm going to compute a statistic on revenue. I'm going to compute the mean and it just it's print, it prints it. So this is all exact too and it's done online. Uh, bagging too. I won't spend too much time on this, but the I idea is that boosting, bagging, there are techniques to do this online. The intuition of it basically is that um, when you're doing bagging, each observation, um, it follows a certain distribution, the number of time it, get, it can get picked by a model. And that distribution, you can show that it follows a Poisson distribution. So very simply, the code is quite simple when you're doing this. It's just when you're learning online, so you have one feature coming in and w well, one set of features and one target, well, for each estimator, 
So you do in bagging, so it means you have like uh, I don't know, 30 models. For each model, well, you pick a number, a Poisson number, right? Um, a, a, a number that comes from a Poisson distribution, and you're going to train the model on that data point uh, this many times, and it works. And for predicting, you're just going to make every model predict, and you're going to say, compute the mean of all the predictions. Yeah? Um, so yeah, an example, so this is not online yet because I'm poor, but <laughs> there's a, we, we, what we did is we, we took League of Legends games and we tried to forecast the, um, this is not moving, huh? Yeah. Oh yeah, you didn't see that. Sorry. <laughs> okay, so I don't know what's going on, but um, so yeah, we tried to take League of Legends games, okay, and we tried to predict the duration of these games. So what happens is that you have a League of Legends game that starts, and you want to predict the, du the duration, and then when the game ends, you know the true duration, so then you can update your model. So if you want to do this with batch learning, you would have waited a month, have a month of data, train your model, use it, and then update, but do you do it every week, every month? This is all online. So you predict and then you train, but all interleaved, all online. So there's no training phase, it's all on the fly. Um, so this, I'll show you quickly some code, but it's quite simple how it works. And the idea is that online learning, because you don't have to train uh, offline, is much simpler to put into, into production. So here you have some games, so, wait, so you predict the duration and then the game ends and it says how, by how much you're wrong, etc. But the games really, so users can put a, a, a game ID in and it's going to make the prediction and then it's going to wait for the game to end and pull and wait for the game to end and then update the model. And it all works online. And here you have the architecture, quickly. Um, so we have random polling, so we're going to check for random games. And then we're going to have some, uh, some user requests, some people are going to pick a game. And then, so this is just a, Django, a very simple Django app. The match starts, we make the prediction, we store the features j until the game ends. And then when the game ends, well, the model can update. And, um, and then we can just show that to the user. So here you have uh, some Django code. Very, so this is to like, exemplify how simple it is to put this in place. So a real machine learning thing that works. Um, so you're, we just have a simple class with, where we're going to store the estimator, so the, really the, the class that's doing the prediction and the learning, in, as a pickle object. Okay? So we're going to work also on doing it in JSON, but for the moment we just do it in pickle. Um, and then you can use this, you can just load it in real time and then, uh, and then do the prediction. But, and also the training. So for predicting, here it is, you just load, uh, you, you get the features online, so you just go to Viat, it's the company that handles League of Legends, you get your features, you get all, you, but the features are calculated on the fly, right? Cream does this, it's not something um, that you do offline. All this is done online. And then the model, you load it, okay? It's in, this is an HTTP request, you do the prediction, and that's it. And then for training, it's the same thing. The game ends, we get access to a new property called true duration. So it's the number of seconds that the game lasted. And then we're going to use this to update the model. So we fit and we take the raw information about the game. So what country, is it a five versus five game, what champions are, are playing, etc. And then we have the true duration and that's it, we train the model. So predict, train, predict, train. And then for calculated and performance, well, you could use a metric like I showed you before, but here we just use uh, an SQL query, so with Django. So you just take the, all the predictions and then you just can compute an average if you want. So this is just some fancy Django code to do that. It, it's just basically an average duration, okay? So this was really simple to put in place. Cream is, we code in it and you know, we, we work on it, but this, the League of Legends app, took me literally a weekend because and the hardest was not the machine learning part, it was really just the web part. But the fit, predict things I show you, that's all there is to it. There's no fancy spark going on, there's no fancy offline, uh, handling it, uh, ever handling, whatever. It's just, it just works online. And that's really simple to do. Um, so the benefits are that you don't have to schedule training, as I said that already. And this is really easy to debug and monitor, because when you're training offline or whatever, you can just do a for loop. And then you know straight away if, you, if you're wrong or not, or the, it's, it's, and you don't have to like, there's no RAM crashing or you have too much data or anything from that. It's really, when you're training, during the fit, during the fit once, you already have some estimate of your error. You don't have to fit and then, then wait and then do the, the validation. It's all online. 
So it's, it's I mean, it's hard to sell this to people because you really have to change your mindset here. It's really changing the idea of not having all your data, but just having it come as a stream. Um, and we think also it's more fun to code with, really. Um, it's also more fun to, to develop with. And so, yeah, decision trees I mentioned, we have them, they're in the library, but they're just not as, uh, they need some polishing to make sure that the, the performance is okay. But there's things called hef hefting trees and there's Mondrian trees. Um, but these are like approximations to the real decision trees you're used to, to cart, but they work. They, after so many 10,000s of examples, they do converge to the same thing as if you did it batchwise. Um, but it's always the fit one predict one API. It's always one set of features and one um, target. And um, and yeah, we, now that some people have joined me, we're going we're going to work on a lot of things. But the idea is to keep it simple and nice, and the same way that Scikit Learn is nice for batch learning. We want to try to make it um, fun to use. So here you have some links. So also, if you want to help or contribute, we not just coding, but also if you just want to try this, maybe at your company or on some problem. Um, Feel free to like get in touch and tell us like what's difficult, etc., or how you how this doesn't integrate with you. Maybe you have some issues or why you could not use this. I mean, I'm I'm really interested why. Okay, maybe that the performance is slightly uh, lesser, but it really is um, close to batch learning. But apart from the performance, why would this not be better than batch learning? I'm really interested to know why because I, I do think that this makes things uh, much easier. Um, so yeah, I'm done. Um, so thanks for listening and uh, questions. <laughs>